Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of I Should Be Painting. Today we're going to be talking about five of my favorite miniature games from the 90s, some of which still exist and some of which have gone extinct. Also, you can see right here, I finished my Marvel Crisis Protocol Display Carry Case Bookshelf! Coming up in a new video soon. So let's get to this week's I Should Be Painting. The first game that we're going to talk about is For the Maelstrom. It came out in the early 2000s and its hook was that you could play with scratch built miniatures. It was specifically designed, even though the game company did also produce miniatures, that you could play with whatever miniatures you want. And more importantly, you could take the rules and you could adapt those rules in order to play with the miniatures that you have or the miniatures that you create. Now. In the 2000s, like, kit bashing was a lot more difficult, most of the models were metal. This of course would allow you to take, you know, models from, let's say, Warhammer and bring them over to play for Maelstrom, but in the age of 3D printing, for Maelstrom and its rules for making armies and creating your own stuff might go really well with the at-home designer and player and with all of these fantastic models that you can just get and download buying off of wherever. So I would strongly recommend if you are interested in 3D printing your own models and you want to try and come up with your own cool like sort of set of rules for whatever models you're making, check out for the Maelstrom. Next, we are going to talk about Battletech and Battletech is still very much alive. And what's ironic is Battletech has come full circle. Battletech came out in the 1984, I believe, which makes it one year younger than me and is actually the first miniature that I ever painted came from that game and I painted it with bright orange house paint. That's right, my mom painted our house bright orange, bright green, and bright yellow and I tried to paint little teeny tiny robots with those three colors and as you can imagine, they were amazing. I was a savant, I wish I could show you, but who knows where those miniatures are. Battletech, if you are not familiar, is a game of mechanical combat played on a hexagon grid. After Battletech came out, they also came out with, an, with a role-playing game that's been very popular. But Battletech was extremely complicated and it had these sheets with like, you know, all sorts of little dots that you had to fill in and specific damage placement and whatnot. And over the years, Battletech has passed through many hands, but now it is back to its original state. And actually two years ago at Adepticon, they re-debuted the new rules of Battletech, which was taking it pretty much all the way back to its roots. If you haven't played Battletech, I strongly recommend it. It's a super fun game. And if you may have noticed, a lot of the uh, people that we've looked at for our featured creators are still painting models because they're still making it. So there is a game which has literally been reinvented, I wanna say five times since 1984. You can still get models for it, you can still play with metal models, and it's really, really fun. If you haven't played Battletech, you should check it out. Next, we're gonna talk about two games from the mid 90s, one from 1995, one from 1997, both from the same company. That company was called Target, and we are talking about Cronopia and Warzone. And Cronopia and Warzone were marketed pretty much as a anti-game to Warhammer 40K. They were skirmish-based games. Cronopia was the fantasy game, and Warzone was the sci-fi game. And you would play with them on the same scale that you would play with Warhammer 40K, but they pretty much took the Warhammer 40K rules and they flipped them on their heads. So instead of playing your entire army at once, and I believe when it came out, Warhammer was still in second edition, although it was moving to third edition by the time some of the later Warzone content came out. But in second edition, 40K, not only did you move your entire army at the same time, and somebody who played, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a long time, but I believe that you also took casualties before you went, or they happened at the same time. It was like this crazy, crazy mechanism where like your entire army goes and then their entire army goes and then all the casualties and everything happened simultaneously and it was really complicated. Um, and people felt at the time that the person who was going first 
often had a very large advantage. So Cronopia and Warzone came in and they said, you know what, we're not gonna play this way. Instead, we are gonna play with little squads and each squad is gonna have alternating activation and instead of D6s, we're gonna play with D20s. Now, I did not get into Warhammer 40K in second edition for two reasons. One, you weren't really allowed to pick what you wanted to buy. Like, I know that they had the books where you could order whatever you wanted, but in fact, Games Workshop really controlled what the game stores were getting. So pretty much the game store just kept getting Space Marines and Chaos, and all my friends already played that stuff, and I didn't want to play another Space Marine army. So instead, I got into Chronopia and Warzone, and those were the first two games that I really played where I bought lots of units and painted them and learned the rules and whatnot as a young, I don't know, how old was I? Jeez, I don't want to calculate it. I was like 13, 1995, 12, 13, there we go. So yeah, that makes me 37 if you guys are doing the math. These games were a lot of fun and actually both of them have had a little bit of a revolution. Um, Target Games no longer owes them, owns them, but Warzone actually came back in 2018 as kind of like a little skirmish game and you can check out some of their models They're really pretty and it looks like Cronopia is coming back out either this year or next year And they have this really crazy virtual reality like art gallery that I'll show right now But also link down in <laughs> down in the description that you can like walk through and check out all the new art So both of these games have come back Cronopia is coming back Which is kind of cool because it's the first game that I ever played and I still have a bunch of those models as well. Maybe one day we'll take a look at all of the wonderful paintings that I did as a 12 year old. Last game that we're going to talk about holds a very special place in my heart, even more so than Warzone and Cronopia, which were my first real uh, games, miniature games that I played. But right around that same time, um, a little bit earlier, in fact, another game came out called Fairy Meat. And Fairy Meat, um, I still collect their models and I have their rule books, is a really fun miniature game, at least I thought it was a really fun miniature game, where you wield a small unit, it's a squad based game, like small, small scale, of either fairies or gnomes, um, and then you fight and kill and eat each other. It is essentially a cannibalistic manhunt um, between fairies and gnomes. Uh, or gnomes and gnomes and fairies and fairies. But the really fun thing about Fairy Meat, and the thing that has always gotten me, um, and what I love so much about it, is that the scale of Fairy Meat is one to one. What? What does that mean? Like, well, 32 millimeter, like that's a scale. No, fairies are act can actually be this size, right? They're mythical creatures and they were thought to be really small. Gnomes were thought to be really small too, depending on what sort of myths or legends that you go by. So Fairy Meat wrote all these rules for this little skirmish game that you could play and your terrain was whatever was in front of you. You wanna play on your kitchen table over your scrambled eggs? Great, that's fine because they're fairies. You wanna go play out in the yard, in the bush with the flowers? Awesome, go do that. And I thought that that was really, really magical and whimsical and absolutely loved playing Fairy Meat. It was a game that I carried around. It was fun to just like go to a steak and shake. And yes, I said steak and shake, not the other variant. And you could just play on a coffee table. It was great. It's a really fun game. It's still pretty easily collectible. Not a lot of people are like swiping up the miniatures as fast as they possibly can. So you can still find a lot of eBay auctions. Um, they're kind of cool miniatures. The fairies are neat. The gnomes are neat. Some of the gnome miniatures are really chonky, like big pieces of metal. Okay, detail. Some of them are pretty, but fairy meat is 
one of those games from the past that just kind of held a special place in my heart because of its silly, whimsical nature and sort of turning the idea of miniatures on its head. These aren't miniatures, they are full-size military units ready to battle on whatever terrain you have available, and that terrain is just whatever's in your life. So there you go, there are five miniature games from the 90s, some of them extinct, some of them still going strong, some of them even coming back. As you may know, there are always tons of miniature games. In fact, also in the notes below, I, have, I found a Wikipedia page that just lists pretty much all the miniature games that they can find and what uh, genre they're in, and you can just go through and look at this list of thousands of different miniature games and click on the Wikipedia and just go through it. I actually was not able to find Vor by just Googling it. Um, I had to find it through this list of miniature games um, because there is a different model called Vor, but it's V-O-R-E related to miniatures, and that seems to just have completely annihilated any memory of Vor Maelstrom, which is probably fine because I don't I don't know how many people actually played that game. Um, but again, if you want, you know, the foundations for making your own army based off of the stuff that you're 3D printing, well, there you go. It's a, it's a great game. Let's head on over to the computer and check out our featured creators of the day. Okay, here we go. We are looking at our featured creators, three of them as always, and two of them this week are Marvel Crisis Protocol related because I got my spinning box of awesomeness just over there. I finished my Marvel Crisis Protocol bookshelf carry case display board thing, and so yeah, I'm into looking at some Marvel Crisis Protocol. We are starting out with a Ghost Rider miniature from Underwhelmed, an incomplete guide to gaming Facebook page. And I really, really like this model. Uh, I'm gonna play his video here in a second, but what I just wanna say is the things about this model that I like so much is how subtle the details are and how realistic the whole model just comes off when you first look at it. And you don't even really notice these transitions of color. Um, you're just kind of like, wow, all of that works really, really well. So first of all, we have amazing OSL lighting. We have object source lighting all over the place. You know, underneath his arm and his coat looks red. We got the yellow coming down onto the exhaust pipes, but also underneath the car, car the motorcycle underneath the motorcycle he's changed the concrete we have these beautiful edge highlights um that just really bring this model to life and give it kind of like this sort of like comic book but realistic look um he's even taking the time to shine the motorcycle as opposed to uh keeping that a matte finish as well so just overall a really 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 fantastic job putting together this miniature and making it look like it belongs in the environment where it's sitting and that is absolutely impressive i love it you should check out this ghost rider miniature and you should check out underwhelmed an incomplete guide to gaming on facebook next we're back to emma okay i don't know i don't know what to say emma's work makes me really really happy and i don't like featuring the same creators over and over again i like to try to find as many new creators as i possibly can because there are so many people doing such great work um but emma is one prolific and b amazing and it just makes me really really happy i think i've said this every single time that we look at her work she has a very unique style I wouldn't try to put it in any particular category, it's just the way that she paints, but her use of color is just so dynamic and so variable and so vibrant, and it just makes me happy. Like, I chal if you're watching this, Emma, which I don't know if you watch them or not, but it, I, I challenge you to paint a miniature that makes me sad. I think that would be hard for you. Or maybe it'd be really easy and it would be way too sad and then I would just fall into a pit of despair because every time I see what you do make, it always brings an immediate smile to my face and it's just absolutely wonderful. So if you don't know Emma and her work, she's all over Facebook, she's a very prolific artist um, and her stuff is like this. It pops, it's beautiful, it's dynamic and it just makes you smile. So thank you for continuing your beautiful and awesome work. It is always a pleasure to look at it. Last up, we have a Iron Man from Amy. Now, here's the thing. Amy posted that this is her first attempt at non-metallic metal. First attempt. Attempt one. <laughs> and it's like, 
freaking perfect. It's amazing. It's amazing. And the thing is, like, this camera is really, really close to the model. I mean, I don't think she painted the hand blurry. And I mean, I understand the camera may not physically be close to the model. The, the photo is very zoomed in on the model. And so we're able to see sort of like distinct layers of how she built up her non-metallic metal, which is fantastic. It's great to see. But you know that when you pull back from this non-micro zoom, um, it is going to look absolutely freaking perfect i mean this is incredible you know i i struggle with non-metallic metals i've been trying it on and off for a really long time and they are okay i've done some okay you know non-metallic metals i certainly wouldn't sit down and be like hmm, you know what i want to do for my first time i want to paint iron man non-metallic metal i mean that's just like going for gold and you got it or red titanium is what you actually get so congratulations this is amazing i love it it's very inspiring um i'm not gonna do it but uh i will i will try to get to some non-metallic metals just to um you know make sure that my chops are up to snuff too so thank you all for sharing your work on the internet and thank you for letting me share it across our channel as always it is wonderful to take a look at what is going on in the world and see everything else that everyone is doing and be inspired by it thank you all so much for joining us remember to like and subscribe hit that bell button so you never miss an update if you want to take your patronage to the next level check out our patreon down below you can also join our discord if you join through patreon you will get special privileges in our discord we always have stuff going on in our discord in terms of taking a look at what other people are hobbying and just hanging out sometimes even us cgn guys are just you know sitting in the voice chat if you want to come and hang out with us definitely do that either just join the discord by following the link or get special privileges by joining our patreon as always this has been aaron from cgn and we'll see you on the table